This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Pastor Jeff Gindelsberger, Lake Moore United Methodist Church here with you on this uh, Sunday, May 3rd. Wow, can you believe it? May 3rd. I am, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm really enjoying the flowering crab apple trees and the other fruit trees that are out right now. Those, those flowering crab apples are just spectacular. Uh, during, this, during this time of COVID-19, been a little bit more attentive to the things that are happening, you know, in nature and trying to give God praise for those things. We've got uh, two cardinals. I don't know where their nest is, but they're uh, finding their way around the, the backyard and into a bush that's by a window that I look out of at times and just really enjoying those. So I hope you're finding in the midst of this season, things to give God praise for, things to give God thanks for, and that you're uh, enjoying the gift of His creation, especially in this spring season. Hey, I wanna thank those of you that are in our area and were able to bring in some toilet paper, paper products, uh, other things. Uh, my understanding is that we were able to give out uh, at least a small quantity of those things, uh, this last food distribution, and uh, should have enough to be able to do so again at, uh, at mid, midpoint of, of the month. So thank you for that. I thought this morning that we might uh, share in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, for some of you, this is something new. For others of you, it's something that you grew up with and and was a part of really a kind of training to know some of the things that were a part of the apostles' teaching and a part of our core beliefs as a church. I don't know how well you can see this. Maybe some of you know it by memory. But I'd like to read it and have you kind of follow with me if you would. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and descended into hell. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He shall come to judge the living and the dead, the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd like to, uh, I think, read the Scripture first today. Then I have a, a little bit of a prayer and then I'll jump into it. That's kind of the way we usually do it. Uh, although we have a, a morning prayer normally here at Lake Moore. But I'd like to begin with a Scripture that's found in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. Probably a fairly familiar passage to some of you. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the, the gift of this day, the gift of being able to be able to look into your word and, and to honor you through through the hearing of it, but more so through the living out of it. I thank you that though we're separated by some distance, we are still the body of Christ, 
still able to, to love and serve you, and at least in part, serve others. I pray, Lord, that you'll draw us to yourself. And out of the overflow of a relationship with you, we will love you, serve you, serve others. Lord, I know that there are some folks that are tremendously discouraged. Some folks that uh, are tired of this uh, way of life. Folks that are in, in dire need of greater financial resources. And certainly those that are in the midst of grief and worry. So we just come to you, Lord, uh, with, with all our needs, but trusting in your strength and your help and your goodness, knowing that you work all things together for good if we love you and are called according to your purpose. Will you take now the words of my mouth, the intention of my heart, and may it be pleasing in your sight, for I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to get into the sermon. I, I just want to say one more thing, I guess. So, so many folks are beginning to wonder how, how much longer and is there a chance that we're going to be back in worship inside, uh, inside the church again? And uh, you may be following this from a different place, but maybe you're asking the same thing about your church. I would say that as soon as I get a word that we can meet in a number of a, of a little bit greater size, maybe like up to 50, I am going to be ready to uh, figure out a plan that we can get 50 folks in here, even if it's several times on a Sunday morning. There just is something about in-person and, and visible connection. But I would say this to you. If you haven't already been able to get a hold of some kind of a mask, cloth mask, uh, even, even a painter's mask, some, some kind of a mask, I have a feeling when we are able to come back together, that will, be, um, that will be something that we'll have to have, to, uh, uh, have in place, wearing, wearing a mask, at least initially, and having some social distancing. So, uh, folks, I am eager. I'm eager to get back with you, but I'm glad to be able to come in this way. Well, thinking about this passage, it may seem odd to look at a passage about the church when we're not able to be the church in the way that we are usually able to do so. Nonetheless, I'm drawn to the passage. Feel that it might be a time like this that we can set the groundwork for a time when we will be able to do so in fullness. And certainly there are ways that we can practice the things that made the early church so vibrant in our day and even in this time. So I hope you'll go with me in this sermon. You won't check out just thinking, man, I don't know if this one is going to apply to me. This is probably one of the most familiar passages on the early church. Many of you will remember there were 120 in that upper room waiting when the Holy Spirit came upon those believers, the, the uh, 11 disciples and others. 120. If, if you uh, would read through, uh, through the events that followed the coming of the Holy Spirit, the preaching of Peter, you'll find that 3,000 were saved uh, in his preaching. And they're still in Jerusalem. So, so we got a church of uh, roughly 3,120. Now, they may all not have been able to meet, you know, obviously uh, in one place. Uh, but they were, they were meeting together. There's two things in this passage that seem kind of contradictory, and yet they seem to exist nonetheless. The practices described are very ordinary. The things that they were doing seem in many sense to be very ordinary, and yet this time in the life of the church was anything but ordinary. Sounds like it shouldn't fit together. Ordinary and, and something so uniquely wonderful. I have to say that maybe our part as Christian believers is the ordinary. And God's part, that which is the out of the ordinary. 
God does that which brings awe and wonder, praiseworthy offerings to Him, multiplication, favor, and much more. Let's see if we can grasp our part in God's part. You know, ours is an age that values the cutting edge, looking so often for that which is unique, the thrill, the out of the ordinary, the awesome, the epic, the amazing, the incredible. Man, we want these kinds of things. If our church could have more of these kinds of things, we, we think uh, maybe folks would be drawn. Uh, I, I'm always encouraged when somebody tells me, I, I put out a word about the, the service that's happening, and I told them it's going to be epic. <laughs> I, I thought, wow, I, I hope it is, but I, I hope you're not overselling. You know, it might seem pretty ordinary in many respects. Few people are drawn to the steady, the devoted, the consistent, the practical, but that's more often where we live. In fact, that's one of the reasons that sometimes new believers seem to drift away because the thrill of the beginning shifts into what is a more normal and uh, man at times seem like a less out of the ordinary experience. There were four things to which the, these first Christians devoted themselves. And these four things, I believe, are the core of life together as Christians. Life together as Christians. They're ordinary, but not so common as they might be. There are things that we know, but things that maybe even uh, we have um, not held to as tightly as we might. The earliest of gatherings of Christian believers, shortly after the coming of the Holy Spirit, and uh, remember, the Holy Spirit changed the dynamic of, of the believers. The Holy Spirit's presence changed the life of those early believers so um, we're at that early stage after the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, and uh, we hear that Christians, Christians devoted themselves to uh, certain practices. They devoted themselves. I did a little uh, concordance study of verses with the word devoted in them. Here's a few of my findings. First, a negative one. In 1 Kings, it says this, As Solomon grew old, and his wives turned his heart to other gods, his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of, his, heart of David his father had been. One time, his heart was fully devoted to God, but it has drifted from that devotion so we, we see this idea that devotion can, can lessen, can shift. But here the psalmist says, Guard my, my life, for I am devoted to you. You're my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. So here's, here's an expression of one who is devoted. And he says, Because I'm devoted, Lord, help me. Help me. We go to the New Testament. And we hear these words of Jesus, no one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. So you kind of get the sense that love and devotion are sort of parallel terms. Uh, they mean the same thing. And then uh, later in Acts, we read how Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. So of all the other things that he uh, maybe had been doing, he began to do just, just that of preaching. He devoted himself to it. There's a, a passage a little bit later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which talks about uh, a single person in contrast to a married person. 
and says that, you know, if you're able to be single, you can give your full devotion to the Lord, whereas a married person has a kind of a split devotion. So um, I think we have a pretty good idea of, of what it means to be devoted, to be devoted. It means to be committed. It means that your heart is there, not just your activity, your heart is there. To be devoted is, uh, is to give yourself to it, uh, not to be divided in your service, your love, your focus. I heard uh, a little story of, about uh, Bill Cower, the former uh, coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. It was said that when uh, uh, Bill Cower took on uh, that coaching role, that uh, he was committed to two things. He was committed to football, of course, in preparation for the games, and he was committed to his family. And that was really about it. Committed to football, committed to family. And uh, on one occasion, uh, somewhere in the midst of his coaching, he happened to be at an event, and there was a woman sitting next to him, and he, he said to her, uh, by the way, what do, you, what, do you, what do you do for a living? And she said, I'm the mayor of Pittsburgh. <laughs> he was a coach in Pittsburgh, but he didn't know who she was. He was devoted to football and the family, and that was it, man. He had a single devotion. Well, the early Christians were devoted, were devoted. They're, they were focused on four primary things, devoted to the Lord through these things. And here they are. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. We use the term apostle really uh, to mean uh, the 11 remaining disciples. The 11 remaining disciples were the apostles. They were entrusted by Jesus to carry out the work of making disciples of Jesus Christ. In fact, you probably recall the Great Commission where Jesus said to these and to some others, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. So uh, the apostles set to that work to sharing the things that they had heard from Jesus, the things that they had been taught, the things that they had seen. They were helped by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come and he would teach them all things and remind them of the things that Jesus had said. Many signs and wonders were done by the apostles, it says in, the, in that section that I read for you, to indicate that they had authority, the authority of God to, to, to teach, to preach uh, these things, just as Jesus' signs and wonders validated his authority from God. Earlier, uh, we read the Apostles' Creed. These things were a part of the Apostles' teaching. It's one of the reasons I chose to do so. The Apostles... And those associated with them compose the works that we have come to know as the New Testament. Paul being included as one uniquely called to the work of, the, of an apostle by the risen Christ. So the New Testament becomes this record of Jesus' words, Jesus' commands, Jesus' actions, the things that they were entrusted to teach. And so the scripture, especially the New Testament for Christians, is um, so valuable to us. There's a place in 2 Timothy, many of you are aware of, where it gives this uh, great word about the scripture. All scripture, it says, all scripture is God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the man, the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. To be the church of God that God has called us to be, we must be devote, devoted to, to His Word. To His Word. Devoted to His Word. I was uh, reading a little bit uh, looking for some illustrations. 
The Wall Street Journal reported that nearly 1,000 different cookbooks are published each year in America, many of them glossy, full-colored, and very expensive. But at the same time, fewer and fewer people are cooking. <laughs> Increasing numbers are eating out in restaurants. Well, not today, but, but in the past, right? The reporter for the journal interviewed one lady, a portfolio manager in New York. She had acquired 16 cookbooks in the last four years and subscribes to two cooking magazines. But the last time she prepared a sit-down meal, she said, <laughs> was four years ago. She said, it didn't turn out too well. <laughs> and I wonder, man, we have the Bible. We have the books of the Bible. We have the scripture. We have the teaching of the apostles. But how real, how real is uh, the teaching, the receiving of God's word in our lives? How, how, how valuable is it? How important is it? How are we making use of God's word? There's a, uh, a pastor by the name of R.A. Torrey who was a passionate preacher of the, of the word and loved the word, was energized by pouring himself into the scripture. A man approached him one day, a Dr. Cogden, complaining that he could get nothing out of his Bible study. He said the scripture seemed dry to him. Please tell me how to study it so that it'll mean something to me. Dr. Torrey said, read it. <laughs> I do read it. The pastor said, read it some more. How? Take some book of the Bible and read it 12 times a day for a month. What book could I read many times a day working as many hours as I do? Dr. Torrey said, try 2 Peter. Try 2 Peter. The man later said, my wife and I read 2 Peter three or four times in the morning, two or three times at noon, two or three times at dinner. Soon I was talking 2 Peter to everyone I met. It seemed as though the stars of heaven were singing the story of 2 Peter. I read 2 Peter on my knees, marking passages. Teardrops mingled with crayon colors. And I said to my wife, see how I have ruined this part of my Bible? Yes, she said, but as the pages have been getting black, your life has been getting white. They gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. Gave themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the fellowship. They were devoted to the fellowship. The word fellowship uh, is this Greek word koinonia. It means to have some things in common. And I would say when they devoted themselves to the fellowship, it meant that they had life in common. And I always feel like uh, the church is healthiest when we're doing life together. If you're a Christian believer today and you really don't have a close connection with any other believers, something is not quite right there. We need this. We need this. I need you. You need me. We, we need each other. They had a common faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, many of them just, just came to faith and uh, came to know that blessedness of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. They were devoted to each other. Uh, the scripture tells us in, in this passage that they, they were eating together. They were living together. They were doing things together uh, that revolved around living and seeking to live the faith. Devoted to each other. Devoted to the fellowship. There's many passages in the Bible, and this is kind of an interesting study for you if you'd ever choose to do so, to look at all the passages in the Bible that have the word one another or each other in them. There's so many things, especially in the New Testament, that tells us about things that we're to do uh, with each other or for each other. Love one another. Serve one another. Honor one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, now, now that's become a hug, I think. Um, 
be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Many more. Life together. Life together. Where, where we talk about not just, just uh, life, um, but we talk about how faith and life interact. We talk about how God is good. We talk about the things that, that we, need. we need help in prayer. Come alongside of each other and we, we tell each other our struggles, but we also share our joys and comfort. I read uh, about a man by the name of Herman Ostry. His barn floor was under 29 inches of water because of a rising creek. The Bruno, Nebraska farmer invited a few friends to a barn raising. Well, not exactly a barn raising. He needed to move his entire 17,000 pound barn to a new foundation more than 143 feet away. His son Mike devised a lattice work of steel tubing and nailed, bolted, and welded it on the inside and outside of the barn. Hundred, hundreds of handles were attached. Here's a picture of such a thing. <laughs> Folks came together. 344 volunteers showed up. Slowly, they walked the barn. They walked the barn. Each up a slight incline, each supporting less than 50 pounds. In just three minutes, the barn was on its new foundation. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. I wish, you know, this is the kind of thing I like to be a part of. Hey, man, we're going to do something big, and it's going to take a lot of us, but together we can do it. Isn't that what the church is supposed to be about? Hey, we're up to something big, the work of God. We can't do it alone. Can't lift the heavy lifting of the burdens that are in our area. But, but God, together, together, we can do what we cannot do alone if you'll help us. If you'll help us. They, uh, they devoted themselves. In these days, we feel uh, the tremendous void left by being, uh, being without a Christian family in close and intimate ways that are so valuable to us. I long, I long to give a tender touch to some of you who I, I know uh, you, you live for those, those times when we can come together as, as the church and you can get a hug or, or just a handshake or, or some kind of human touch because you don't have that. You live alone. I wish I could see your faces. I'm privileged to see Justin's when I do the recording, but I'm, 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 I'm thankful for his, but I'm also grateful to be able to look into your faces and your eyes. I love to work side by side with you, to sing together, hear your voices, and praise to our Lord. We're able to do some of these things today. and Folks are getting creative about how to connect with people as believers. And that's good. Uh, at the same time, we, we long for that life together to be fuller. And I'm hopeful when that time comes that we'll be able to come back together with a new sense of, I need the church. I need other believers. I want to be with other believers. And I hope that we will devote ourselves to the fellowship, to sharing life together. Here, uh, they, they shared life, not every moment of it, I'm sure, not every moment, but in real ways where they can love, encourage, correct, benefit from each other, and keep on growing in the faith. Keep on growing in the faith. Third thing, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now, they could just be speaking of uh, taking time to eat together, which they definitely did. And a little bit later, it says they gathered in their homes breaking bread. So I'm sure that they did eat together. But I really think that uh, what was uh, more in mind was uh, taking part in communion, uh, what some call the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. Somebody called me up the other day and said, when are we going to have communion again? I said, I don't know. How are we going to do it? 
But we're thinking about it. We're thinking about it, and, and it may be possible that we can have uh, communion. Maybe those of you who are watching uh, YouTube, I'll give you a little heads up. Hey, we're going to try to do communion. You're going to have to provide your own elements. But uh, for those that are coming to our parking lot service, we're thinking about some other possibilities that can safely uh, be able to do communion. You know, uh, Jesus said, uh, when you eat this bread and you take this cup, you will remember me until I come again. Remember my death. Remember my death for you. I heard a story of a father who died uh, somewhat unexpectedly and early in life. When it came time to uh, do the service and to have the burial, uh, the mother, for whatever reason, felt like the, the children uh, might be disturbed by that whole process and so chose not to have the kids come and be a part of it. But later on, she began to think that maybe it was important that they would be able to go to the cemetery and to see the place where their father was buried. And uh, she asked a minister for help, and he consented to go along to kind of help in that process. Only one of the children went. And they came to the cemetery and to the, the grave marker, and, and the minister said this to, to both the mother and to the, the daughter that was there. You know, this doesn't have to be a place of sadness. We can come here and remember your dad. In fact, you can come here in this place, even have a picnic. <laughs> Share and remember and think about him. And you know, that idea of a picnic seemed pretty odd at a, at a cemetery. But it lightened their, their spirits and the child that went to the cemetery told their Brother, you got to come too. We can think about God. We can think about our dad. And we can share life together. In the breaking of the bread, we remember Jesus' death for us. And all that it's made possible. And we remember His coming again for us. Those early believers didn't want to lose track of that. They wanted to let the, the sense of the forgiveness and all that God had made possible through Jesus, His life, death, and resurrection to be the focus of, of their, their worship. And, and regularly, they got together and they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. I, I'm glad that Jesus gave us this. I'm glad that we can... We can have it as a way of remembering. I forget sometimes important things. So I'm glad to have these holy days. Kind of the root of our word holiday. Holy days like Christmas and that uh, Thursday supper. Good Friday and Easter. Those holy days especially to think and remember Christ. And here in, here in Lakemore Church, we have a tradition of typically having communion the first Sunday of the month. So we try to remember it regularly and have it be a part of things in our life. And finally, they devoted themselves to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. A couple weeks ago, I, I gave a sermon that had, had this kind of a focus, come near to God. He will come near to you. We call upon the name of the Lord. We come near to God through prayer. Prayer is our great resource. Prayer is access to God. The Holy Spirit enables prayer and helps us as we pray. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. You know, uh, Certainly when we gather as a body of believers, there's usually at least one prayer said. Sometimes when we have meetings, most times when we have meetings, we begin in prayer and sometimes end in prayer. But we don't want prayer just to be kind of a, a routine. We don't want prayer just to be kind of a filler. We want prayer to be that which is vital 
to who we are and what we're about. I don't know, in, in these days in, in, in Christian churches throughout our land, if, uh, if the church would really be known as a house of prayer, might be known as a house of worship, might be known as a house of learning, and preaching, it might be known as a place where folks can be helped with physical needs, but Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer. We need the power of God to live a God-honoring life. Our world needs the resources that God alone can provide. I know that we're often confused by prayer. We may feel like that we lack words to pray. We may not be great at conversation or communication with people or with God. But don't make it so hard. Talk sincerely. Approach God with faith believing in the goodness of God. Come to Him armed with His Word. Appeal to Him humbly. Pray. Keep on praying. Join with others to pray. Four very ordinary, probably familiar things to us. But they were truly devoted to them as their life together with one another and with God. And because of these four things, God enabled some out of the ordinary things to occur. All about God's ability. Signs and wonders done by the apostles, but more so because God was empowering it. Believers being generous with possessions. Not giving up everything necessarily, but sharing as others had need. I mean, that kind of generous spirit is, is uh, the mark of God at work. Who among us would give except that God motivates our hearts to love and respond? Believers being generous with possessions so that needs could be met. Glad hearts. Worshipful uh, hearts. Joyful worship. People seem to say, let's get together. <laughs> you got some space in your house. Let's get some believers together. <laughs> Here are the apostles teaching. To break bread. Communion. To pray. To be together. And the scripture says something that I'm not sure it's, uh, is being said as much as it could be, although I'm, I'm happy whenever I hear it. People outside of the faith thought well of those within it. On the community grapevine, we might say, people were saying, I, I don't know about this uh, thing of Jesus Christ, but those people sure are great people. <laughs> those people sure do love the Lord. Those people sure are kind. Those people sure are gracious. What a, what a working of God when that's the case. And people were coming to faith. The Lord was adding to their number daily those that are being saved. Don't we long for that to happen in our day again and still? That God's adding to our number those that are being saved. The people are coming to know the Lord in a real and personal way. God enabling that to happen. The Lord adding to the number. You know, when we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to life together, to remembering Jesus' death and keeping at the core of who we are, and to praying with all our heart, for God to work in our midst and in these days, God will bring about the things that are so needed and so valuable. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this, uh, this reminder from those early believers filled with the Holy Spirit of what they did and how, how it impacted the world, even to the point of impacting us. Lord, I pray that we can be that kind of a church for you. I know that there's um, perhaps many congregations represented by those that are hearing these words 
as well as Lake Moore United Methodist Church. But where, wherever we are, may we join with other believers really living this faith that is honoring to you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're up to. What you're up to in these days. May your name be praised. Amen. Hey, I would just say one other word. You may be aware of something that happens on the first Thursday of every May, and it is the National Day of Prayer. So whether you're home or, or, or you're still working, maybe you can especially remember your, your nation, our nation, its leaders in prayer. Maybe you could also pray for some of the other things that God's been laying upon your heart. COVID-19, certainly, but other things as well. This Thursday, uh, I believe it's May 7th, National Day of Prayer. Okay, God's peace. Amen.